Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bill DeWalt, President and Director of the Musical Instrument Museum. MIM's founder and board chair, Bob Ulrich, has said, the goal of the Musical Instrument Museum is to illuminate what is unique about cultures and also what is shared and universal. The museum currently displays 5,000 of over 15,000 instruments from 200 countries and territories around the world. Bill DeWalt previously directed the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh and has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. And I'd like to thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Sure, it's great to be here. So the Musical Instrument Museum is a completely unique institution. Let's talk about the museum because it is different than a visual arts museum. It's different than a natural history museum. It's different than a technology museum. And in many respects, it combines elements of all of these types of institutions. That's absolutely right. And it's uh, unlike many other musical instrument museums. There are musical instrument museums, uh, especially in Europe. But primarily what they do is they focus on Western musical instruments. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do from the very beginning is to collect uh, musical instruments and audio and video of those uh, instruments being played from every country in the world. So you have the, the collection at the core of the museum, and it is incredibly diverse, but then you also have these other elements. You have sound, you have the visual elements. You walk in, and it's, it, it, it's a beautiful uh, facility. From the point you come in and, and you equip yourself with technology to experience. Uh, yeah, we use instruments. something uh, that's called the Sennheiser Guideport system, uh, and we are by far the largest uh, installation using the guideports uh, in the world. But the great thing about this technology is uh, it fits so well with the goal of the museum, and that is to make musical instruments come alive. I mean, if you just see clarinets hanging on a wall, it's not particularly interesting uh, unless you're really into clarinets. Uh, but what we do is we have these instruments from every country in the world, many of which are uh, totally unfamiliar to uh, the people who are viewing them. And what the guide port system allows us to do is to have audio and video on a continuous loop. And so simply as you walk up to an exhibit, you uh, automatically get the sound of what's on the video monitor in front of you. You don't have to punch any buttons, you don't have to do anything. It's completely, you just walk from one exhibit to another and the, and the guide port system picks up the sound from the video monitor that is right in front of you. And so it's, you're and it's not, very compact. It's, it's, it's a little hmm. thing with headphones and you, it's all proximity uh, based. Yeah, yeah, it's about the size of uh, you know, a Blackberry or uh, any other uh, small telephone. And you're right, you're not only seeing musical instruments, but we have collected uh, uh, dance outfits, we have collected masks, we have ha collected other things that are typically associated with music. And we also include little maps uh, that shows you where that country is in the world. So if, you've, if you don't know where Bolivia is, or if you don't know where Guinea-Bissau is, there's a little map that puts it uh, in the context of Africa or Latin America or the continent that it's part of. What is so interesting as you tour the, uh, the museum is the selection of the videos and what the videos cover. Mm -hmm. It is not simply a replaying of a few bars of music. Uh, there is context that, that, that is provided. Sometimes someone is talking about how the instrument fits into uh, daily life. Sometimes people will talk about the, uh, the manufacture of the, uh, of the instruments. And of course, you hear the instruments being played. Right. And actually, uh, in very few of the uh, displays, is there any talking involved? Uh, you're right, in a couple of displays where we focus on the manufacture of a particular instrument, like the Steinway piano right. or like uh, Martin guitars, there is a bit of talking. But otherwise, uh, what you're doing is you're just walking from one exhibit to another and you're getting very short clips of the musical instruments that are arrayed in front of you uh, being played. So you find something that uh, you know, has one string and it doesn't look like very much, and then you see these people uh, making amazing sounds uh, with this instrument. So it's 
it's great because you know visitors from any country can enjoy the musical instrument museum as well as people from the United States because uh, there's very little language involved. And you can see the connections between the instruments that we're familiar with mm -hmm. uh, and the instruments that, that uh, we just look at and we say, what in the world is this? And then we hear this, this beautiful and, and wondrous sound coming out of those instruments as we're walking through the museum. Yeah, I think the, the great thing about the museum is that uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and uh, one of the things that, peop that cultural anthropologists talk about uh, endlessly is, are there really cultural universals? And actually, music is probably one of the few cultural universals that you can point to. Because as far as we know, all peoples at all times and in all places uh, have felt the need to create these amplifiers of human emotion, musical instruments. And so as you walk from display to display, one of the things I think you're uh, uh, absolutely just blown away by is the vast array of things that people use to make music. But you're also impressed by how uh, things have spread from one culture to another. So uh, it's you know people adapting and adopting instruments that are made in other time at other times and at other places by other peoples, uh, and they're adapting them to their own cultures and to their own uh, particular needs. So you see these xylophones that uh, have gourd resonators, and you'll see them in Africa, and then you'll see them in Latin America, and you'll say, "Wow, you know, where's the where are the connections there?" Uh, and in some cases, we know what the connections are, and in other cases, I think uh, that ethnomusicologists and other people are still trying to investigate and figure out, you know, which way did the influences go. And it's fascinating nowadays with the uh, rapid communication that we have. My daughter is, is obsessed with Korean pop music. Uh, <laughs> And and you see the the uh, Bollywood influences in 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 the West and the and the Western influences all the way throughout throughout Asia through the Arab world. Um, it's 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 just amazing how music seems to permeate our soul and the barriers to adopting other ideas uh, fall in the face of these kinds of uh, cultural intersections. When people leave the museum, and we get this all the time through emails or guest comments or uh, just talking to people, that people leave uh, MIM with a very simple but very profound uh, message or understanding. And that is that, you know, at a time when there are all these things that divide us, race, culture, politics, etc. There's really something that kind of is, uh, that unites us, that we all feel a need to create music for the same kinds of occasions. And so, you know, at a, at a certain level, we're all the same. We all have these, uh, these needs to create music to kind of feed our souls, if you will. How did you get involved in this, in this project, coming in from a career that had been with a renowned natural history museum and then transplanting to Phoenix. Um, and my understanding is that you came when, the, uh, when it was a building site. It was, it was basically a hole in the ground. Yeah, actually I came before it was a hole in the ground. Uh, I commuted from Pittsburgh to Minneapolis for about six months uh, because our founder, Bob Ulrich, uh, at that time was still the CEO and chairman of the board of Target Corporation. Uh, and it's Bob's philanthropy that has really created MIM. So when I was hired, uh, it basically was an idea, and uh, Bob hired me to kind of bring that, uh, that vision or that uh, idea to uh, a reality. The, the way that I got involved, I mean, I, uh, a lot of people, I think, ask me, how did you, you know, move from being a college professor. I mean, I was a distinguished service professor uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. I was kind of reached the pinnacle of my profession. And, uh, you know, my feeling is that I had gotten to this point in life where I had written all these books, I had edited all these books, written all these articles, and there were probably about another dozen people in the world who really cared about what it was that I was working <laughs> on. 
And so uh, I was lucky enough to be nominated to become uh, director of Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh uh, and uh, got that job. And as I was thinking about it, I said, you know, isn't this wonderful? You know, here you've got 250,000 people a year who are going through a museum. And if you can do some significant projects here that uh, uh, will uh, improve the museum, uh, and improve the visitor experience, you really are doing something that's uh, pretty major. So in Pittsburgh, uh, we took uh, a project that uh, probably had been on the books for 50 or 60 years, uh, and that was to do something with Carnegie's dinosaurs and to make the, the, the impact of them uh, greater. And uh, what I was able to do is to kind of come in with a common vision, create a common vision with the team there, uh, and then effectively fundraise uh, during very difficult times, I might add, because uh, I became director there in February of 2001, right before 9-11. Uh, and uh, you know, what I tried to do there was to keep everybody motivated by saying, look, yeah, the economy's down, yeah, everybody's scared, but this is the time to be friend-raising. Uh, and that friend-raising eventually will turn into uh, fundraising. And so in a matter of six years, we were able to take this idea that had been on the books for a long time uh, and to bring it to reality. And it was that that I think attracted Bob Ulrich when he was uh, looking for someone to uh, bring this museum to life hired a search firm, as uh, many, many people do. You know, actually, the, the search firm uh, president said, uh, we have the perfect job for you, Bill. And I said, what is it? <laughs> and he said, director of a musical instrument museum. And I said, are you crazy? I don't know anything about musical instruments. And he said, no, you're the perfect guy for this because, number one, you're a cultural anthropologist. You have contacts all over the world. This is going to be a global museum. Number two, you obviously know how to put together a staff and uh, create a vision that people can believe in. Uh, and number three, you know how to fundraise. Uh, and number four, you've got to meet Bob Ulrich. And <laughs> Bob is just so incredibly passionate about uh, this museum and creating something that really is a worldwide attraction. And uh, you know, as soon as I met Bob, I knew that uh, the two of us could work really well together and uh, to bring this to reality. And we did in what I think is record time. Uh, you know, basically, he had this vision in 2006. I was hired in uh, March of 2007. And we opened a 200,000 square foot museum uh, in April of 2010. That is an incredible story. So it's, a, it's basically a three-year uh, span from the time right. you first met. Right. And we were able to do it, fortunately, because of the philanthropy of Bob Ulrich, uh, who brought the resources to the table, uh, and also was very involved with me in working uh, with the architects, uh, working with the exhibit designers, uh, you know, working on every aspect of, uh, of the building. and. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it, was, it was a lot of hard work, a lot of stress at times, but uh, also, you know, just incredibly rewarding. Could you uh, give us a, 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 a bit more insight into the uh, physical dimensions of the, of the space, um, uh, your visitorship, and, mm -hmm. and so on? The principal architect for the building uh, is a man named Rich Varda. Uh, and Rich has done a lot of major projects uh, in Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota, uh, but around the world. Uh, I think he won a prize for the Skyscraper of the Year uh, for a billion dollar project that was done uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but the great thing about working with Rich was that uh, we did not try to create a building that was uh, the product of an architect's fancy, and that would be a monument to him. You know, we have core values at the museum, and uh, you know, the first core value uh, that has guided us from the very beginning is to be guest friendly. Uh, and guest friendly is all about the space, feeling bright, light, 
uh, you know, we've, we've kind of uh, uh, turned some of the museum paradigms on their head because a lot of people uh, try to build museums that are kind of like caves to preserve the objects. Right. And then also to give people an insight into uh, some of the things that people in museums do. And so having an open conservation lab uh, where people can actually watch our conservators working on these objects uh, coming in from all over the world um, was a, a really central part of that. And you have a beautiful performance space as well, a, uh, a theater. Yes, again, and that goes back to making the musical instruments come alive. We make them come alive in the uh, displays through the audio and video and then in uh, an acoustically superb space of our performance hall, 300 seats, really intimate, but absolutely wonderful in terms of acoustics, you can quite literally listen to the world uh, because we have performers coming from all over the world uh, to, to play. How many visitors uh, traffic the museum um, annually? Yeah, uh, well, last year was our first full year of uh, being open, and uh, so just in terms of visitors to the museum, we had 215,000. We had uh, about another 20,000 people coming to performances in the music theater, and then special events, you know, the kinds of uh, parties and uh, uh, events that people have uh, after hours, uh, you know, it's probably another 30 or 40,000 more, so, you know, Going from zero to over 250,000 uh, in one year is pretty amazing. And your public programming is, is incredibly diverse. You have a, a, in Phoenix a venue that you're also using to introduce different types of music. I mean, one of the most popular displays in the museum is of uh, what we call the African guitar, because it's literally made from an oil can. And that is the resonator of what is now an electric uh, guitar. So, you know, using repurposed materials. But the point is that uh, in addition, musicians are now, uh, you know, all over the world are making music and they're making these incredible blends of music. So, I mean, one of our performances that I said, oh my God, you know, how, how's this gonna work? was uh, actually a uh, R. Carlos Nakai, who is a wonderful uh, uh, Native American musician here, primarily plays the flute, uh, and he's paired with a Hawaiian performer who plays, you know, the guitar. And I'm saying, how's this going to work? But it worked beautifully because these two guys, uh, you know, have had some influence on one another, and so they each played a set of their own, and then they got together to play a set. And you could see, you know, these musical influences from two different parts of the world coming together uh, beautifully. In dialogue, and, one with the other. Yeah. And that happens all the time. I mean, one of my favorite concerts uh, so far at the museum is by a group called Playing for Change. Um, and uh, this is the product of, uh, uh, you know, a brilliant guy who started going around the world and recording street musicians, people who played for change. And I think the first product of, that he did was uh, Stand By Me. And so he had mm. musicians from the wild, around the world playing Stand By Me. And then he cut them, spliced them all together into a video, uh, which was a huge YouTube uh, sensation. So now he has taken many of those street musicians from different parts of the world and put them together into a band uh, that goes around. And, uh, and they performed at the museum. They all had flags from their various countries. Uh, I think there were about 10 countries represented. Uh, and these people from all over the world playing amazing music. That is just amazing. And one of the amazing things about managing this museum is that you have the lowest of the low tech where you're preserving instruments made from uh, beaten bits of iron and, and tangs that vibrate to, um, to very ornate uh, stringed instruments, mm -hmm. um, very ornate um, instruments that do require a huge amount of care, climate control, and so on. Uh, to um, maintaining the uh, electronic context which allows people to hear the instruments using those proximity sensors and, and the various devices. You have to plan operationally to sustain this museum. Talk about the 
financial thinking that goes in to running this this nonprofit as a self-sustaining business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, another one of our core values is sustainability, and uh, so we've had that from the very beginning as something we absolutely wanted to do. Uh, both Bob and I are very much in accord that one of the things that we want to make a part of our operating budget is to set aside money every year so that you know when the roof leaks or when you need to make major uh, improvements to, to the building uh, that you actually have that money there uh, in order to be able to do that. And technology and, doesn't stand still. The same is true of technology that you've got to constantly be uh, upgrading it, you've got to, you know, you've got to, you've got to be cutting edge uh, because I think that's what people uh, expect these days. And uh, you know, again, going back to and one of our four core values, uh, I've already mentioned two of them, but a third one is ever changing. You know, we want to constantly be collecting audio and video of music uh, from around the world. Um, so. You know, when you think about museums, museums are about preservation. You know, it is that very simple act of taking something and putting it into an environment where it's going to be protected and preserved for future generations. But it should also be about, about presenting that to the public in a way that's accessible and that uh, is, is guest friendly. I love technology. But I only love technology that works and that's simple. You know, yes. you know if I got to sit there for five hours trying to figure out how some gizmo works, forget it. That's not going to work. And in our museum, the great thing is, you get a set of headphones that everybody you know knows how to use. You get this little device that you put on your belt or on a lanyard around your uh, neck, and you that's walk it. up to a display, and you don't have to do anything else except smile and enjoy. Now. Uh, many museums have um, docent programs, educational programs, and so on, and you've, you're a relatively recent uh, museum, so uh, these programs are still in evolution. But, but talk about how you are engaging others in, in the affairs of the museum, of, uh, in, in, um, in helping you to present uh, this incredibly rich collection. Yeah, the, the great thing is, and again, people are inspired at MIM. People love the place. And so from the very beginning, uh, of course, we've been recruiting volunteers. We now have over 350 volunteers uh, as, uh, as part of MIM who do everything from being ushers uh, at the performances uh, to uh, some, some of them work in the uh, museum store, others uh, help at guest services, cleaning the headphones uh, as they come back. Uh, so doing a lot of things in the museum. Uh, and then uh, over a hundred of those have already gone on to become docents, uh, and they've gone through our training programs. Uh, and it's principally them who uh, run our school tours. Uh, and what's great is for me to just walk around the museum uh, and see these people who have been accomplished professors or doctors or lawyers or whatever, uh, and now they've got, they're kind of like me, they've got a second <laughs> career, uh, if you will. Uh, and that is, you know, talking about music and musical instruments uh, with uh, younger, the younger generation. So, so again, last year we had uh, 26,000 kids come through the museum. Uh, this year we're on track to probably do 35 or 40,000, and eventually I'd love to see that grow to at least 100,000. That's just phenomenal. Well, Bill DeWald, thank you so much for your leadership of this wonderful institution, and thank you for your insights. Well, uh, it's great to be here, and uh, it's great to, to talk. And as you can tell, I get passionate about uh, this museum that we call the most extraordinary museum you'll ever hear. Thank you so much, Bill.